Certainly is our pleasure to bring you in the trenches with Dave Lapham, brought to you by First Star Logistics. And our very special guest in this one is wide receiver, special teams player extraordinaire, Trenton Irwin. This guy graduated from Stanford. Tells you all you need to know about his IQ, general IQ and football IQ. And this guy takes every snap seriously, whether it's in the game, in the pregame, in practice, in OTAs in the offseason. He is 100% full go every single minute of every single session. That's just the way he approaches the game. That's why he's still in the National Football League. He's dealt with adversity. He's overcome hardships. He's a team player. He's Trenton Irwin. Welcome once again to In the Trenches with Dave Lapham, brought to you by First Star Logistics. And we're in a little bit different location at First Star Logistics, not really in our studios, but this is what you would call the palatial studio. (laughs) We're in the lobby of uh, First Star Logistics. Check out that. That's you you ever, Trenton, you ever seen anything like that? I mean, this this is big. There's no question about it. I know. I was going to do it right for you. And by the way, that's our special guest and very special guest today. Cincinnati Bengals wide receiver, special teamer extraordinaire, Trent Norwin in the house with us, and we appreciate you carving time on a on a day off, man. You could be doing a lot of things. For you to be right here with us is greatly appreciated. Hey, happy to be here and chat chat it up. I like that. So, I remember we had you on our radio show on Friday, um, our pep rally show at Buffalo uh, Wings and Rings, and you said, "Look." Don't worry. You know, we're not worried about it. It didn't work out. We played, we had our, our worst game of the year. It happens. We're going to put it aside. We're going to come out. We're going to play ball. Did you ever? I mean, <laughs> man, that, that's about as dominating a performance, particularly in the first half. I don't think I've ever seen an NFL game dominated to that extent as you guys dominated the Carolina Panthers. What was the key, do you think? You know, I, I think we brought energy early and often. You know, things were clicking. Um, I think TB made a big catch early in the game. T had a couple early catches and really got the ball rolling. And, I mean, our run game, our screen game, our play action game, our quick game, everything was working. So, I mean, as an offensive coordinator, that's that's a dream. And as a defensive coordinator, I don't know what you call for any of those situations. So, I mean, we, we had things clicking. We were just trying to get seven points every drive. And we came out with seven five times in the first half. So, that's impressive. It really is. I mean, out of your first eight drives, six of them ended up in the red zone, and every single one of them you guys punched in for a touchdown. Six for six in the red zone and low red zone. I mean, you know, it was inside the 10-yard line. You guys were just muscling them everywhere. Yeah, I mean, like I said, we had every option in the world. It felt like I would block and then Joe Mixon would go for 20. And then (laughs) I'd run a guy, you know, run a go, and freaking TB would have a ball for 15, 20 or – like we were never really in a third and eight that looked like it was going to be a tough conversion. If we were third down, it was like third and one or two, and then we moved the chains. So it was impressive. It, it's you know you as a player, a former player, but I mean player mentality. Mm. You you look for balance, and this football team, the the play selection was very balanced in this game. Your first drive, uh, ninety yard drive on nine plays, five passes, four rushes. One of them was a screen, which I call, mm. you know, kind of. It's almost Brilliant. like an extension running. So I'll give it four and a half of each, you know, <laughs> four and a half runs, four Bounce and a half passes out. for 90 yards. And the Carolina Panthers had not allowed a, a, a first drive touchdown. They only allowed one in 25 games all of last year and half of this year. They'd only allowed it one time. And you guys go 90 on them in nine plays. Did that set the tone? Did you guys come out thinking, you know, if we can do that to them early like this, we, we set the tone here? Wow, I, I didn't know they didn't have that. I didn't know that statistic. Um, coming into it, we knew their defense had played well. Uh, we also knew that their offense had started real slow. So when we get the ball there, we figured, hey, let's let's put it on them. Let our defense do what they do. And, you know, we got got the ball running quick, running the ball, screen game. Everything was clicking. So we got after them and, and never took our foot off the throat there. So you were balancing that first drive in the first half, 22 first downs you guys had. 22 first down plays because you kept just cranking and uh, 11 runs, 11 pass, <laughs> 11 runs went for 77 yards, seven yards per 11, uh, eight of 11 passes were completed, 11 called, eight completed, like almost 90 yards. So, I mean, it was as an offensive coordinator, when you're in that situation, it's like, 
close your eyes and pick a play and it's going to work, right? I mean, it's like whatever you call is going to happen. Yeah, I mean, you talk about 7.7 carry. That was one of our goals, our must wins to to win that week. We had to have – we wanted 4.4 yards to carry and five yards after the catch. Um, and I think we exceeded both of those with 7.7. I mean, and after the catch, I think we went wild too. So here, here's some of the first half numbers that, that we're talking about. The Bengals ran 45 snaps, 311 yards offense in the first half, 35 points. They ran 17 plays, 28 fewer, but 32 yards. The defense held them less than two yards a pop per play, Holy not way. per run, per play. You have the ball 21 minutes and 44 seconds. They had it for eight minutes and 16 <laughs> seconds, <laughs> plus 13, 32, which took a quarter away from them in the first half. I mean, they, they only had the ball for a quarter. You had it for two. I mean, it was crazy. And then the running game. 21 rushes, 147 yards. Joe had 113 Jeez. yards on, on 15 carries, three touchdowns rushing in the first half. It was just nothing short of uh, spectacular. And, and, and Joe Mixon, I thought, uh, gave you guys kudos. It was so well-deserved. One of the first things he said in his post-game presser is, I want to credit my wide receivers mm -hmm. for the way they blocked on the perimeter. Because you guys, you heard him inside, but also you were doing the pin and pull you know, and getting linemen yeah. around the horn. And you guys were doing an unbelievable job sometimes with that pin, sometimes blocking on the edge and letting Joe get to that second and third level, turning a six-yard run into a 29-yard run. Yeah, I mean, I think we took a lot of pride in that this week. You know, I think the last few weeks we sort of learned from some mistakes and, and try to get scrappy in those situations. And and me, myself, I, you know, I'm, I'm more known as a route runner, but I, I, I needed to, you know, put some – blocking stuff on film to be able to help the team win and that was that was part of my role in that in that game so we took pride in that had some fun with it and I mean once Joe got going there was no stopping him as everyone else saw so hopefully we keep that momentum going even though we got a bye week but we'll run that momentum going and if we can run and I mean, it's it's like a guy who can shoot and drive like what was you gonna do so I always look for guys that bring the energy and the enthusiasm to it and that's something that you're all about I mean Every single practice, every single snap at practice, when I watch you, it's like, we'll go. Mm -hmm. It's like you're running around like you're running in the game. When I watch you in pregame warm-ups, you're running the same tempo, the same intensity that you do when you get out in the football field. You don't waste any reps. I mean, everything for you is like, it's go time. Let's get after it right here. I think your teammates feed off of that. Is that is that something that you've noticed? That's definitely something I try to bring. If I'm in the huddle, I try to chirp a little bit, you know, talk some trash <laughs> or just try to set the mood. Um, try to sort of set the scene, see how everyone else is feeling too. But I, I mean, the way we were clicking, everyone was everyone was working together, and I think it was we all we all had that mission and uh, you know a like there. But I, I do take pride in my ability to just reload every rep and just you know 100. percent You love the game of football, you know that's obvious, um, and and you've dealt with adversity from a career standpoint. Mm -hmm. You know it hasn't always been the easiest path for you. You've been waived. You've been. Uh, put on practice squads. You've been uh, put up to the active roster and, and everything in between. What's the key to fighting through all that and saying, I'm here and I'm going to stay here? Man, you know, um, I think there's a lot of keys. I, I think it's it's one of those things that you got to always be learning. You know, you can't ever be sitting there in a situation and think you have it all figured out because as soon as you do, it's another thing that comes around. So I think it's always adapting to your environment, you know, and, and figuring out what your role is. But also, I, I think there's a, a beautiful balance between gratitude and like goal striving. So, you know, you got your gratitude to be able to, you know, be thankful for where you are in life, um, you know, playing football, but you also have your goals that you want to go after and go achieve. And so, you know, you might be thankful, but if you're not achieving your goals, something's got to change, you know? So for me, it's like, okay, I, I'm not where I want to be. That might mean I need to do more film or catch more balls or, or talk more with the coaches, see what I need to do to be able to achieve my goals. And, you know, in the end, my goals are going to help the team. And I know that. So I think that's a been, that's been a battle for me. And I think it's a, a battle in general because some people are just too thankful for what, not too thankful, but, you know, thankful for where you are, that they're not striving for more. And that sort of doesn't allow them to grow. So that's where I, my mind's at. There's a similar uh, path between your career and, and Troy Walters, the, the wide receiver coach. Both you guys go to Stanford. <laughs> yeah. You know, both you guys get, you know, opportunities from the NFL out of Stanford. He was a receiver with the Indianapolis Colts, also a return guy. Yeah. You're a receiver with the Cincinnati Bengals, also a return guy. Make make a mark on special teams. I think you're one of his favorites because 
he can kind of see himself in you mm. and, and he understands how important it is to you, how, how much it means to you, you know, and he knows you're made of the right stuff and everything. Do you think that you guys have a special bond because of a lot of those things? I definitely think we have a bond. You know, I think it's, it's been easy with Troy since day one, but I, I am actually blessed with Troy as a receiver coach. I think he's the best receiver coach I've had my whole upbringing through football just because he played it at that level, but he doesn't only bring the skill sets. He brings the mentality. He brings the, you know, that going through hardships. He understands what everyone's going through, but is also there to be able to try to bring the right mood to a game day, to a practice, to a, you know, just never being – just being relentless. So I, I think Troy's one of the best things I've had as a receiver coach and just as a player to be able to have. That. Man, that's a, so along the way, at, at any level of football, talking about Troy being a big influence at the professional level, but was there a coach in your youth football mm -hmm. league days, high school football, college football, where it's like, man, as I reflect back on this, this dude was big. I mean, this, this dude really opened my eyes to a lot of things. Is there anybody like that? It's a fascinating question. Um, I would say, I'd say the coaches had different roles in my in my upbringing. Uh -huh. um, I think you know, Coach Shaw at Stanford was an unbelievable person, an unbelievable coach. But um, I love his taking the players as more than just a player. You know, he was able to sort of see people as people that you, sometimes you lose in the in the game. You know, see people as pawn pieces. So I think Coach Shaw did that in a excellent manner but um i think there's you know i can go back to pop warner that just allowed me to love the game and just go out there and and have some fun all the way to this level where we are it's all our jobs right. and it's a business and it's you know you get the job done or you don't but it's also the situations where i've been in other organizations where it wasn't as i felt like people were pawn pieces you know they were just all right these guys are not gonna get the job we're just gonna cut him and get someone else in and um, there's, there's definitely got to be a balance in organizations to where, like, you still treat people as people. Now you have to get the job done. That's your job as, as the player um, to be able to get the job, to be able to listen to the coach. But I do think you are still people. And when you treat people as people, I think that they are able to excel at a higher level. It's interesting and it's fascinating you bring that up because everybody that I talk to on this football team talks about the culture mm -hmm. in the locker room. And – the relationship that players have player to player player to coach coach to coach coach to player it's it's like at every level it's 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 very unique the bonds are really tight and close have you ever experienced anything like this on another team or is this the best that you've seen this is the best i've seen and it's not even close um, really you know it, it comes down to little things you know i've talked about in the locker room playing games and um you know the trash talk that goes back and forth i i don't know it's the trash talk i think is almost a training to yourself to be able to believe in yourself you know um and i'll trash talk with all the dudes and <laughs> i honestly look forward to it like i'll go play ping pong with jesse or cornhole with you know whoever right um and it's i mean the team you know everyone definitely has you know a recognition of each other's abilities and i think that's that's obviously needed if you don't can't perform you won't be there long and that's just just a matter of fact but um overall the cohesion of the team is just it's special and i'm i'm happy to be a part of it but happy to keep this thing rolling so that everyone else stays a part of it too you know it, it's interesting uh you can do almost like a um a psychological evaluation of <laughs> makeup of teams and my experience the good teams that i played on in you know teams that went to the super bowl as opposed to the teams that really struggled it is it was the intangible stuff like respect mm. trust just like in any relationship yeah. any success sex successful relationship there's respect for each other and trust in each other at the highest level you can possibly you know, trust each other and when the team is good that stuff is like a plus mm -hmm. when the team's struggling that stuff's bottomed out i mean there's there's very little of that i don't know which comes first i don't know if the chicken <laughs> or the egg you know you start having success all that stuff comes or that stuff makes you have success but you know when you have it, yeah. and you certainly don't want to lose it when you know when you have it, right? No, that, that's a that's a great point. I, it's on paper. It sounds you know you got your trust, you got your communication, you got all your things on there. On paper, it seemed great, and it's hard to figure out when you have it and like is it the success that allows it to happen or it come it precedes the success. It's a great point, but I, I think it's definitely it's definitely a feel more than a tell. Like you can't tell them, right. Hey, go do this. It's like, okay, you feel that that dude's got my bag and I got his back. 
and you've had enough reps to be able to know that. And it, it the trust is just, it's a feeling. Yeah. To me in watching the relationships that guys have developed, it's organic. Mm. You know, it's not like the coaches say, all right, look, I want you to go and I want you to, Make some sort of something happen relationship wise with that. It's not you can't force that kind of no. thing. It's either there or it's not, right? I mean, and you guys, it's it's very organic, man. It just it's it's right. It happens. Um, it's it's very interesting to see. Let's talk about another coach that uh, has been instrumental in your in your career, and that's Darren Simmons, who's Darren been Simmons. Bengals special teams coach for over twenty years here in Cincinnati alone. And the one thing that I know after observing him for all those years is there is nobody that pays attention to detail with any more sense of urgency than Coach Simmons. Am I right on that one? Oh, you're 100% right. That guy's – that standard for excellence is way above anyone I've really ever met. So he – you know, you got any play, it's it's supposed to be right here. And if it's not right here, you're going to hear it. <laughs> so, I mean, I love Coach Simmons, but you all you got to know a little bit KYP that he, he expects that standard, and you got to bring that to the table. And if you don't, you got to learn from that next rep and go bring it the next rep. You know, one thing that you figured out very early because you are an intelligent guy is that, you know, whatever somebody needs, I'm going to do it. Oh. And and you're you're you got a versatile skill set, and you'll cover kicks, you'll return kicks, you'll play receiver, you'll you'll do whatever it takes to be a a part of the success of the of the football team. As a return guy, mm -hmm. what's the secret? What's the secret to success? I I know you have to be almost you know a maniac to be back there and <laughs> sacrifice your body like you guys do as a return guy i i don't know if i could keep my eye on a football and know that i've got guys running 100 miles an hour at me and and you're standing still waiting for a ball and you're going to make somebody miss and run that that skill set is like what but what what other besides that besides mm -hmm. having the courage to do it yeah what else do you have to have to be a great returner to be a great returner, you definitely got to trust it. Because, I mean, you talk, even talk about the flight of the ball. You know, punters are, at this level, are elite in the sense that they can manipulate the flight. You know, in a, in a plus 50 punt, they could throw a knuckleball up there that knuckleballs, you never know which way it's going to fall. They could throw a helicopter. They could throw some. They could throw all sorts of spin on that punt. So <laughs> that you got to trust that you're seeing the spin on the punt and to be able to get your feet in the right position. But also, it's a feel for where the guys are because you can't be looking there and you can't just be looking here. So you got to be able to scan, trust and feel and just, you know, even if something goes awry, you got to still maintain that trust that you can get the job done in that sense. So I think that's that's a unique aspect of it of anything I think is with failure you have to ma maintain that trust in some way or shape or form and that's what the best do. So let's go in the way back machine. Let's go back to uh the high school days mm. of, of Trent Irwin and now you're you're performing at a high level obviously you have you have opportunities to play to play college football and you understand that you're a student athlete and you're going to take advantage of not only the athletic part of it but the academic part of it because the athletic part of it is going to end someday hopefully mm -hmm. not for another 10 years but not. at some point in time you have to have uh some sort of a, a training for something with life after football what uh, what was it like for you to be a high school athlete? Were you not only a great football player, did you other play other sports in your high school career? So I didn't play any other sports. I ran track going into high school for football. Okay. But I did not play any other sports. Um, I pretty much just locked it down with football, and that was all I would do. Off season would be seven on seven, some you know speed work here and there, but it wasn't really uh, wasn't track. Um, I used to run the 400 and 800 in Ooh. track, but did not like those events. That's dog gut there. Oh, no. Dog gut those races. Are, I got all sorts of respect for those people, but that, <laughs> that didn't apply to the game, so I had to drop that, <laughs> and I didn't like it either, so I dropped it for that reason too. So did you play uh, defense as well as uh, offense in high school? I played cornerback. Yep, I played cornerback and free safety. Uh, you know, just really I watched myself on film. I did not know what I was doing, um, but I was out there just an athlete trying to make plays on the ball. Um, but I mean, you know, whatever had to be done for the team there. Uh, we, we actually won our CIF my junior year. So that was exciting. Senior year, we, we fought, but we did not. So, but having played corner and safety and now playing yeah. wide receiver, did it give you a little bit of a different understanding and appreciation for route concepts mm -hmm. and why you're doing them and how it might affect the defensive back? Because you saw it on the other side yeah. and you know, it's like, Oh, I know what he's thinking. I, at least I remember what I was thinking when this happened. Did that help you at all as a receiver? I think it definitely did. I think, it, you know, it allows you to sort of see tendencies, see people rising up, 
and you know whatever give giveaways they have i think um at the level i am right now i know sort of how a db should move um in order to you know i mean like i could just analyze db's techniques and sort of see where there's sort of a chink in their in their play style and um i watched myself back then and there were a lot of i wouldn't even call it a chink at that point i just had no armor on i was just naked but um you know I, it helps looking at the opponents and you get to see okay he opens his hips up here early or he shoots that hand every time or he's gonna soft shoe out of there he's not a quick jam guy you get to be able to decipher those tendencies that they have and attack that in a different way because if he's gonna soft shoe out of there you got to attack him and you soft shooting back pedal and you're going faster forward. So you can, you know, you can play with that and you can change his style of play. And if you can ever change someone's style of play because you know them that well, then yeah, I feel like you already have the upper hand because they're comfortable with their style of play. So you have a great high school career. You have college opportunities and you choose to go to Stanford, the Harvard of the West. We're actually Harvard's the Stanford of the East, right? There we go. I mean, isn't that, isn't that really pretty much what we're talking about? <laughs> Lowest emission rate out there. <laughs> yeah. Like At any rate, you're talking about a great academic institution. Um, why Stanford and what other options did you maybe have? So I had a lot of the Pac-12. Um, had a couple schools East, but I really I cut it down to uh, Stanford and ASU huh. for the longest time. Um, and that was because my quarterback in high school was going to Arizona State. Okay. So he actually ended up going there. And I actually had to sit down with him at a Starbucks to sort of break up. It was like a <laughs> tough conversation because, oh, like, package that was my guy. <laughs> I freaking that was my guy for like seventh, eighth grade, all the way wow. up for six years. So, like, we sat down at a Starbucks. I had to tell him I was like, I'm going to Stanford. I just <laughs> wanted to let you know. So you found out first. Um, and he's still my my freaking best friend to this day. So wow. But Stanford was was the move. Um, my mama wanted me to go there for sure. You know, she was like, it, it doesn't, it's a no brainer. It, yeah. So, I mean, it was, it was a given and, and I'm very thankful still to this day that I went there. So that's a good sign. Now your mom was an educator. She educated you, right? She's a teacher. She's yeah. a teacher and educated me from a young age. I had a little private school and it was from like first through seventh grade. I had my mom for a couple of those years and some te other teachers there oh. other years, but yeah. So you go to Stanford. What, what did you major in at Stanford? I mean, you, it's not like, you know, a jock school where you, you don't go to class and you just play football. You, you got to go grind at Stanford, don't you? Grind. You got to grind. Uh, I majored in STS, which is science, technology, and society wow. with a focus in nature and their environment. So sort of animal conservation huh. type things, sustainability, all that good stuff. But it, huh. I don't know how applicable it is to the life skills yet. And we will <laughs> figure that out. But it was something I was interested in and I wanted to just explore it. Yeah. So take us, take us through the process, Stanford, and then, okay, the National Football League. Take us through that transition from college football player to National Football League. Yeah. So college, you know, you go, classes are probably from like, you might have a lift seven to eight, classes from 8.30 to 12, you get lunch, 12 to one, you're ready for practice, two to five or something um get done with practice by the time you get back to dorm it's like 6 30 7 to 10 might be homework and then you repeat that um nfl it was a little bit like shoot i go eight to five and then i'm like shoot i got i got this little five <laughs> to ten period that i don't know what i'm doing with and i'm out here by myself you know i don't it's not like i'm coming home to family or you know you come home to your, you know i don't have a girlfriend out here or nothing so you come home with a girlfriend watch a show it wasn't like that i was like dang what do i do so most of what I've done this year is actually still ball. I'll still watch film. I have these little balls that you like tie up to a fence and you throw them and they just come back. Cause I don't, I don't have a jug machine or a person to shoot a jug machine. I could buy a jug machine, but I don't have that the person yet. Um, <laughs> so I just, I tie this little ball to a fence and I throw and I catch about hundred, 200 balls there, really? watch my film. And you know, that takes hour, hour and a half. By the time that's there, I, you know, stretch, eat, go to bed. Man. Yeah, so you practice, you have another, individual workout practice and then you stretch and go to bed man you are you're a pro's pro there's no doubt about that China, man. okay so I, I gotta bring up a sore subject but uh oh how the heck did they not give you a touchdown on that on oh. that catch in the corner are you kidding oh me i mean oh when they Lord. when they went to replay i'm like all right look the effort that he gave if it's close at all a guy that gives effort like that no matter who the player is you got to give the guy the touchdown. Uh, and why the heck the guy didn't signal touchdown and, the, and then review it automatically because they wouldn't have overturned that nope, either. Nope. Whichever way they called it, it was going to stand, right? Yep. It was one of those, one one of those, those kind of plays. 
how much did that aggravate you? Yeah, that one hurt. I didn't I didn't know how I didn't know it was in and because I looked at the ref, he said complete. I was like, damn, I must have been out. But watching on replay, I was waiting for that ref to come up, you know, have to review. And I was waiting right. for his hands to pop up. I right. was praying. I was like, come on. Like, and we were all celebrating at that moment, yeah. too. I was celebrating with Joe, Stanley, <laughs> Dan Pitcher. We were all like, oh, that's a touchdown. Foot's down, ball's there. Yeah. It, it, it hurt because that would have been my first career touchdown, too. And I didn't really know it was for sure going to be in, and then it wasn't in. So that one hurt. Um, you know, luckily we still scored, but. Yeah, that, 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 one, that one's going to hurt for a little bit, and I got a week to think about it, but we got another week to go get back in the end zone and make it happen. Unbelievable. Take us through Take us through the play. Yeah. You know, what, what's the route called? How did it How did it unfold for you? What was the good deal there? Yeah, so, I mean, it was just a go ball. We were like, shoot, we can't get caught in the field of play because I think there was like 11 seconds left right. in the half. Um, we had no timeouts. It had to be end zone. You know, it's, it's situational football. You can't throw it in the field of play. You can't get sacked either out of the bounds or it's an end zone catch. So I ran a go, looked back. I saw Joe scramble on my way, and I was like, oh, hello. But I tried to stop. Man, like it was sort of turned into a comeback down the sideline, tried to drag my back foot in there. And I thought I was in. Ref said no. And Man. then we looked at a replay, and we were all hyped. But it, it was a roller coaster of emotions. Luckily, we did score the next play. So for the team's sake, we did, we did still score. Right. But for my sake, it still hurt. Take us through the 14-yard reception you had in that yeah. game. Yeah, they they gave us cover zero. That was cover zero there. Um, that was not the original play. Um, we went out there and Joe saw what he wanted, gave me, you know, told me what to do there pretty much. And we executed for 14. I, I almost wanted the guy to be closer so I could make a move because I was a little bit in no man's lane because he was still catching right. up. Right. But it was a great ball, great play, play call by Joe there. And, um, you know, it wasn't really something we worked that much, but it, it worked out when it came down. So how often does that happen? I, I remember when C.J. Uzama was playing tight end, he said, you know, I, I'll look at Joe and Joe will look at me. And I'm like, you seeing what I'm seeing, even though it's not the game plan. Are you seeing what I'm seeing? And I'm going to we're going to do this. And, and Joe's mm. at football IQ is men's. I mean, it's crazy, I'm right? How, how often at the line of scrimmage you have to be on alert all the time? He'll change it. Whenever, right? I mean, oh yeah, he'll he'll change it whenever. I mean, I remember playoffs. He had a signal that was, that was like we learned in week two. I was like, <laughs> oh shoot, what's that one mean? Um, so like he'll change it all the time, and I think that's one of the coolest things that he's able to do is he's able to just sort of be free, like in his thoughts. That it's like it's not polluted with any you know preconceived ideas. He's just free and okay. How would we attack this? And he's able to communicate and get that out, and communicate to the O line to get that protected up. And even if it's a look that's unscripted or unseen, I think that allows you to be able to just attack whatever look they're giving you. So I'm going to talk about the wide receiver room here for a little bit. Even yeah. though Jamar didn't play for a couple of games, he's still 11th in the NFL in yards <laughs> with 605. He's tied for fourth with six touchdown passes. His 15 third down catches are tied for third in the NFL. And again, you know, he hasn't played for a bit. He's got 47 catches tied for 10th. He's in the top 10 in just about every category, top five and others. And then you've got other very talented receivers. I mean, uh, uh, T. Higgins, obviously, Tyler Boyd, the only trio of wideouts that have uh, yards receiving of 500 yards or more, three of them, 500 wow. yards or more. With that said, your wide receiver room is real humble. You guys are all tight. I mean, there's no egos. There's no, yeah. you know, it's me, me. It's all we, us. It's, it, it's, it's pretty impressive. Where do you think that all comes from? Oof. Um, you know, I would definitely have a very humble, very talented receiver room. And, um, you know, and they also promote the other players' success. And I think that's unique. Um, I think some of that comes from Troy. I think Troy is, is a fantastic receiver coach, fantastic coach in general, and a great person. But, um, you know, without those guys on the team, though, they, we still wouldn't have that. And I think it's unique in the sense that everyone wants to see everyone succeed. And you can feel that. And I think that also comes with trust. You know, when everyone wants to see everyone succeed, if you got a, we call it a, like a run for the love of the game route, which that ball's never coming your way, but you're running so that someone else can get open. If you got one of those, I think who met, no matter who it is, if it's Jamar, if it's TB, if it's T, they're all still going to run. You know, they're not going to be lazy. They're not going to slack there. They're all going 100, 100 miles per hour. And I think that's unique. You know, you don't, you don't see that on a lot of teams. You'll see a lot of receivers, you know, complaining and, you know, throwing fits and what have it. 
and we got to run for the love of the game route and Jamar will still run that full speed. And I think he sets the tone there in that sense because you know he gets doubled all year. You said those stats, but he's getting doubled all year. Right. He's got those stats getting doubled all year. So right. that just puts that on a different level. Um, and I think the whole receiver room sees that and everything that he does and everything that Troy does too. Man, there's a tremendous amount of talent in that in that room. There's there's no two ways about that. Uh, you guys were so adamant about forget that Cleveland noise. Do you think the short week helped? The fact that it was Monday mm -hmm. Night Football and it's like we're gonna have to put it away real quick here, you know, because we got we got to get ready for the Carolina Panthers. We got to compress five days work into four days here. Or knowing you guys, it would have been like, look, we're just moving on no matter what. You guys do such a great job of compartmentalizing and not letting it linger, yeah. you know, and, and, and move on. And I didn't see anybody sulking, nobody pouting, nobody, you know, it's like, look, we just screwed up. That's yeah. it. It's over. Let's let, that's pretty special. Yeah. I think the team has a unique way of compartmentalizing a mistake from who you are type of thing. We are still an elite team, even though that, that Monday night wasn't pretty. That was a mistake. That wasn't who we are as a team. That wasn't, you know, that was, a couple plays away from being a totally different game. And if you're able to compartmentalize those two things from an incident and who you are, I think you're able to exceed your own potential or at least, you know, hit that potential. And I think we've done that at a high level, you know, bounce back from losses, bounce back from, you know, tough starts. Um, and I think that just comes from an, an identity of understanding who we are there. Okay, so you go and you, like we talked about, you smoke the Carolina Panthers. Now the bye week. Mm. What are you going to do on the bye week, my man? Man, I, <laughs> it's been nine week, nine, ten weeks straight, something like that. Um, I'm probably going to be golfing, probably going to be in the facilities a little bit, try to study some film there, get a little bit of a head start, uh, take care of my body, get a massage. But um, it's going to be a little bit of a quiet week. I'm not quite sure yet. See, that what you're talking about, to me, that, that speaks volumes because, you know, a lot of guys – you definitely want to get away from football, yes. you know, for, for a good part of it. But the fact that you're still going to go in and get your workouts, uh, watch some tape, to me, that speaks volumes. And I think a lot of guys are in that category. Even if you go somewhere, even if you go to Florida, you yeah. can still watch tape. You can still 100%. work out. And I know everybody's going to do that. You know, you might want to get out of town. and But these guys, all you guys are pros, pros. And you don't want to in, – in a week – it's amazing if you don't do anything, how quickly you can get out of shape. It's wild. And you want to stay with it. You want to take care of your diet, get your rest, all that kind of stuff. Because you got the Pittsburgh Steelers coming up, you know, after that buying. You owe those dudes, man. We owe them. And we owe our division. Yeah. We're 0 3 in our division right, right now. Having been 5 and 4 and 0 3 our division just doesn't doesn't sit well. So, you know, we have a lot of, a lot of home games there. We got Steelers at their place, but the other two at home. Um, but definitely excited for that divisional game to come right back. I think that'll be a high energy game. And I think we're going to set a statement there, but it's a standard. You know, it's everybody talks about um, five and four. That's exactly what the football team was last year at the bye week. Now you have a different second half to a season. Yeah. No doubt about that. But you come out and you win two in a row after the bye, you're seven and four. Then you lose two home games to teams, the 49ers in overtime, and, and you get handled by the Chargers. And it's like seven and six to middle of November. Yeah. No big deal put together a, str a stretch, put together some some W's, and you do that, and you end up winning the division. Is that the mentality? It's like we've been there. We know what it takes. We've we've uh, lessened our margin for error. You know, we know we stubbed our toe maybe when we shouldn't have or or uh, and preferably wouldn't have lost games we lost, but here's where we are. Everybody going to approach it that way? I think for sure. I think we've been there before, but we also have to understand that you can't put yourself in a position where one game can turn the tide. You know, you put yourself in a vulnerable position at that point. So, I mean, every game from here on out is really like a playoff game in our mind in the sense that it's all or nothing. We got to go get it. So I, I think that's the mentality going into next week, going into most weeks after that. And, you know, one game here or there might not go our way, but we can't ever have it not go our way because we didn't start the way we wanted to or come with the right mentality to approach that game. Get you out of here on this. Of all the qualities that this football team has, mm -hmm. you know, positive things that we've already talked about, the tangibles and intangibles, what is it that strikes you the most? It, maybe I know it's hard to do, but five, 10 years down the road, when you're reflecting back yeah. on this football team, what might be the first thing you think we had this type of season because we 
Mm. Um, I think everyone's bought in. I think everyone's just bought in. You know, it, it's one of those things at the college level, you see guys, you know, who go do some random thing and, you know, you're like, dang, you're not really trying to work. You know, you're coming, you're showing up drunk. You're showing up, you know, not, you know, you're late, you know, late to a meeting. You, you can see that he's not really bought in. He's there for something else. He's there for the fame. He's there for someone else's opinion of him. He's there because it looks good for girls that he's there or whatever. But I feel like everyone on our team is bought in for a purpose. And, and you can feel that. And I think that when it comes down to it in the end, you'll be able to tell, hey, they, they were bought in because the third string guy who came in made a play when it was his, and his name was called, you know? And I think you can, you can sense that in, in every little aspect of the team there. Yeah, that's been a great thing to see too, you know, when guys get their chance. They're in the NFL for a reason. Everybody mm, is. Yeah. You get your chance. A lot of times you don't want to get the chance because of an injury to a teammate. Right. But it's life. And it when it's there, you have to take full advantage, right? I mean, 100%. No question. It's easy to see why the National Football League wants Trent Norman to be part of it. <laughs> okay. It's easy to see why you went to Stanford. You communicate well. You're a smart guy. Appreciate your time. And thanks so much for doing it at the beginning of the bye week. Actually, you guys, the team got – an early buy because it was on a hand to the point where guys got rested <laughs> and a lot of guys got chances to take snaps. <laughs> they did. And the buy started before the game ended. Before was it was even over. It was unbelievable. It was great. It was great. What a game. Appreciate it, man. You're the best. Appreciate you having me. At First Star Logistics, we're a very strict company that really puts the pressure on our employees. <laughs> Brakes? What are those? That's what I'm talking about, Icky. Get the body right, then the mind's right. You know, yeah. you know you gotta get that body right. That's right. right. Yes, sir. <laughs> Become a star with a chance to earn the highest commission percentages in the industry as a freight broker agent. Check out firststarlogistics.com.